Hello and welcome to Middle East Matters, I'm Julia Kim. This week's show takes a special in-depth look at the Yarmouk refugee camp, once home to the largest concentration of Palestinian refugees. When the Syrian war broke out, Yarmouk was placed under a brutal siege, leading it to be described as the worst place on earth. We'll be speaking to filmmaker Abdallah Al-Khatib, who chronicled this period in his documentary, Little Palestine, Diary of a Siege. But first, we're going to revisit Syria's Yarmouk refugee camp, located just eight kilometers from the center of the capital, Damascus. It was home to over 150,000 Palestinian refugees. When the Syrian revolution broke out, President Bashar al-Assad viewed the camp as a haven for rebels. At the end of 2013, the Assad regime laid siege to Yarmouk, turning what was once a safe haven into an open-air prison for its residents. Founded in 1957, the Palestinian refugee camp of Yarmouk lies in the outskirts of Damascus. It's benefited from a kind of autonomy over the years. For a long time, this lively market neighborhood was a rear base for various Palestinian factions, such as Hamas and its former leader Khaled Mashal. Then the Syrian uprising in 2011 changed everything. Yarmouk was initially spared due to its neutral position in the conflict but was eventually targeted by the regime to punish some of the residents who had rebelled against him. Bashar al-Assad ordered the bombing of the neighborhood on 16th of December 2012, killing dozens. The rebel factions, the Free Syrian Army and the Al-Nusra Front then seized the camp. From then on, it was under siege, relentlessly bombed by the Syrian Air Force. Muk was a refugee camp transformed into a death camp akin to one of the lower rungs of hell. The vast majority of its population fled. For the some 18,000 people who remained, Yarmouk was now an open-air prison surrounded by regime forces. Left to the threat of both bombs and famine, dozens died of starvation. My father is dead. My mother is injured and stuck in the camp. I came here to get food. Tell them to give us something. Then the situation got even worse inside Yarmouk after its capture by the Islamic State group on the 1st of April 2015. Residents lived in fear of not just the fighting, but also jihadist abuses. Their reign over Yarmouk lasted three years. The Syrian army eventually forced them out in May 2018 after a month of bombing and relentless fighting. Several weeks later, the regime announced a possible reconstruction and resettling of residents in the camp. But hopes for a return to normal life there are low. I will not return to, the, to my home. No. There is no hope. No hope. No hope. No hope. No hope. With permission from Damascus, a few dozen families are believed to have resettled there since 2018. But the vast majority of Yarmouk's inhabitants have sought refuge elsewhere. Well, to revisit one of Yarmouk's most traumatic events with us is filmmaker Abdallah Al-Khatib, who joins us on the programme today. The siege of Yarmouk is documented in painful, intimate detail in his film Little Palestine, Diary of a Siege. The footage was recorded on tapes and smuggled out of Syria to Lebanon, Turkey and ultimately to Germany, where the filmmaker now lives. After more than seven years, the documentary finally saw the light of day. Let's take a look. الحصار طويل كيوم أسير لا ينتهي في زنزان سكة حديد تمتد نحو الصحراء في يوم صيفي Well, our guest today is the documentary's writer and director, Abdallah Al-Khatib. Thank you very much for joining us on Middle East Matters, okay. Abdallah. Now, I wanted to start by asking, when residents had the choice to leave before the siege started, why did they choose to stay? Uh, first of all, hello and thank you for having me. The Palestinians decided to stay inside the camp to avoid repeating the experience of leaving that they were forced to go through back in 1948 when Israelis chased them out of Palestine. Also, not all of them had alternatives to get out of the camp. Some of them had the opportunity to go to Europe, but most of them didn't have that choice. 
staying inside the camp was their best option. Now, in your film, you document in such painful detail the suffering these people went through, the indignity and desolation of what it is to die slowly of hunger every minute, the agony of that. What went through your mind when you were putting this film together, putting these sequences together to make this documentary? Okay. Uh, when I was putting the film together, I was constantly thinking about how to make a film about starvation and death without touching the dignity of these people. That was the first question. When I was in Yarmouk, I tried to focus on and report on the little details that are usually ignored by other media. I tried to highlight things that are related to the emotions of the people, how they feel, what their life looks like in the camp. I was also filming them with dignity. I mean, I filmed the people the same way I would have liked to be filmed. And finally, when media talk about these people, they generally just talk about numbers, numbers without identity. What I tried to do with Little Palestine was to bring the victims' identity back to the forefront and to show that these people have names, lives, families and dreams. Let's take a look at a clip from this documentary. <laughs> what did the siege teach you living through this horrible experience? What were the lessons you took away from this? Uh, okay. To be honest, I learned so many things from the siege. I learned that there are many tasty plants that we could eat. I'm joking. I learned how to see life from a different perspective. I learned to see the value of things differently. All the things that we live with today, technology, modernity, etc., are just a big lie. Because we could lose everything in the blink of an eye. The question is how we get to live after we lose everything. For me, this was a big lesson. Because today I realized that I could live without technology or modernity. Now, we still see famine being used as a weapon of war, even today. We saw it in Ethiopia, we see it in Yemen. What goes through your mind when you see this uh, still being used? When I thought about making Little Palestine, the idea was to make a film about Yarmouk, but at the same time, a film that talks about the idea of siege and the idea of starvation no matter where it is happening. And it was very important for me that when people see the film, they don't only think of Yarmouk because Yarmouk is over. Instead, I want them to think of Ethiopia, Somalia, Yemen, other places in the world where these massacres are still occurring, where we can intervene. We can't do anything for Yarmouk, it's over. Unfortunately, these sieges and these methods of starvation are still being used. I don't think the cruelty in our world will end one day. What I wish, though, is for all of us to come together and support each other and have a positive impact on one another and support the people who suffer from these atrocities. Now, there's not very much that remains of Yarmouk today. Do you think you'll ever go back? I don't want to go back, even if the camp were to be just like it used to be, or in a situation where the current regime was no longer in power and returning was possible. I don't feel mentally capable to go back to Yarmouk. I had a terrible experience there. I suffered a lot of personal losses there. The whole place reminds me of a very dark time in my life. Maybe I'll change my mind in the future, but for now, no. I believe the most important thing is to go back to Palestine, not necessarily to the camp. Palestinians are in Syria because they were forced out of their land by Israel. And the most important thing is for these people to return home.
What do you hope people that are watching this for the first time take away from your film? <laughs> A feeling of shame. What I wish is for people to be ashamed, to feel that they are responsible for everything that is happening in this world. We cannot always say that the governments decide for us, because these governments, especially in Europe, are the result of people's decisions. They elected these governments that are making these decisions. I don't want them to feel pity for us. We don't need their pity. We don't need anyone's sympathy. I want them to feel responsible toward themselves especially, and then toward other people. It's very important for Europeans to understand the roots of their luxury and comfortable life they are living. Other populations are paying so that they can live comfortably. This life did not come from nothing. It came from a long colonial era and occupations of other countries and the stealing of other people's resources. Abdallah Al-Khatib, thank you very much for your time here on Middle East Matters. That's all the time we have for today, but there's more news coming up here on France 24. Stay with us. From North America to the southern tip of Patagonia, join us for a look at the latest political, economic, cultural and social news from the Americas. Inside the Americas, presented by Jeannie Godula on France 24 and France24.com. It was not until 2004 that Romania's full role in the Holocaust was revealed, second in significance only to Nazi Germany itself. The city of Yash experienced one of the deadliest pogroms of the Second World War, with the number of victims in the hundreds of thousands. Today, the Jewish community is just 3,000 people, and Romanian historians are fighting to instill a duty of remembrance. 25%, 30% of the population of Romania knows in a correct way the of Shoah. The Shoah remains a largely taboo subject in Romania, and the fear of seeing the mistakes of the past repeated is growing. Revisited on France 24 and France24.com.